Hello, and many thanks for joining us on the news on ATA International. I'm Chimobi Walter Naji. Let's go with the headlines. Federal government releases guidelines for export of goods under African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uganda's incumbent president, Yori Museveni, wins a sixth term in office. As COVID-19 deaths reach 2 million globally, United Nations Secretary General Guterres describes lack of coordinated efforts. Now let's go into the details of the news as the federal government has released guidelines and steps for export of produce and products to other African countries under the AFCFTA Arctic. A statement by Director General and Chief Trade Negotiator Victor Lehman says all exporters and their agents must secure licenses, certificates and all the relevant documents from the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, Standards Organization of Nigeria, NAFTEC and from the Nigerian Quarantine Services. The exporters must also secure approval from the Nigerian Customs Service and certificate from NASIMA. Other documents needed for shipping goods under the Free Trade Agreement include Certificate of Origin, Bill of Lading and Commercial Invoice and of course the Packaging Lists. And of course joining me to talk more light, to throw more light on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement guidelines in Nigeria is the Director General Nigeria Agri quarantine services, Dr. Vincent Isegbe. Glad to have you with us, Dr. Vincent. Thank you once again. I'm grateful for the invitation. All right, so let's begin with the fact that Nigeria Quarantine Services you know, is among government certified outfits that will uh, give approval to exporters under the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Could you outline the criteria to be met by the exporters? Well, as Every international uh, business transaction is uh, done. There are permits to be issued. Um, there are certificates. There are conditions of trade that we as a country must necessarily observe to enable us to partake in the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Nigeria being a very large country, population of about 200 million people, we must necessarily obligate ourselves to ensure that whatever is required of us in the course of that trade, you know, is perfectly executed by Nigeria as a country. So the criteria is that every international obligation that is due, we must observe it. And every obligation that we have as a country, Nigeria, being signatories to all the conventions protocols, we must observe them as well, particularly as it relates to the African uh, contentional free trade agreement. Those are the things that we must necessarily observe to ensure that uh, those criteria are met in the course of the trade. All right, so if that is so for Nigerian exporters, now what happens for those coming in to trade in Nigeria? What criteria should they meet under the, the new trade agreement for them to bring in uh, goods and services to the country? Now, this is one area that I believe the, um, the national um, chambers of commerce, trade and industry and the various commodity associations and exporters associations will need to come in order to be able to inform those people involved in the trade. From the regulatory angles, they know exactly what they are supposed to do, the, the, the certificates and the inspection and certification that they need to do to be able to uh, enable their uh, products pass uh, for, for the trade. But then the processes involved, I think the various uh, commodity associations and the chambers of commerce will need to play a very big role in sensitizing the various members of the association or their chambers as to what to do in order to enable them to. There are series and series of um, protocols, there are series of uh, other things to be done 
which time will not permit us you know, to mention one-on-one -on -one here. I understand that perfectly. But then, uh, the, the question really is, for those who intend to bring in agricultural produce into Nigeria, what criteria should they meet? And then, uh, take this as a second phase of the question, mm. what agricultural produce and products are allowed to be traded? Okay, for agricultural produce, first and foremost, if they are plant and plant products, they need to have what we call the phytosanitary certificate which is international recognized by the international quarantine organizations that permits products to come in. Others are health certificates as it relates to animal and fishery products. Those ones are very important. But when it comes to endangered species, the CITES certificate, which you know, controls the endangered species, that too has to be uh, brought in and acquired from the Federal Minister of Environment. Then for the agricultural produce that we can export as a country, I can say that Nigeria is well blessed with so much of agricultural produce that we can export. Be the conventional commodities that we know, rice, maize, and beans. And then the emerging ones like cinnamon, turmeric, um, ginger, honey, even cow horns and hoops. All those commodities are available in the country. And as the quarantine service, two years, two years ago, um, we were able to bring in a uh, highlight 26 agricultural commodities which were showcasing to Nigeria and to draw the attention of farmers and exporters through the value chain that we have put in place to ensure that those commodities will be exported. All right, Doc, uh, your, your organization is not um, uh, permitted, so to say, to, to go to the ports. How can you effectively do your job of uh, certifying goods? Well, we are there at the ports with the coming of the um, African Continental Free Trade. We had discussion with the Secretariat of the African uh, Continental Free Trade, and we are discussing with the Federal Minister of uh, Finance as well uh, to finalize the details of formalizing the return of the Nigeria Agricultural Quarantine Service to the ports. There is no way that we can do our jobs effectively if that is not formally formalized. What I mean is that there's a government procedure for doing that. While that is going on too, the issue has been identified, it has been addressed, and um, we are there at the ports, you know, to be able to do what we are supposed to do in furtherance of uh, Nigerian export, import and export trade. So that whatever we are able to produce as a country will be able to meet the international uh, requirements for Nigeria as a country and will not have rejection of our products. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Dr. Vincent Isegbe. He is the Director General of Nigeria Agri-Quarantine Services. Many thanks for being with us on the news. Thank you, it's my pleasure. All right, and uh, Uganda's Electoral Commission has declared President Yori Museveni as the winner of the presidential election conducted last Thursday. The electoral body says Mr. Museveni won about 59 of the total votes cast. Details with Musa Babali. The 70-year-old President Yueri Museveni has been in power since 1986. In it was a big blessing. And this is the sixth time he will be winning the presidential elections. Amid accusations of vote rigging, election commission chairman Justice Simon Mugangi announced that Museveni won almost 59% of the votes, with Bobby Wine trailing with about 35%. He said turnout was 57% of the almost 18 million registered voters. The close rival to the president, Bobby Wine, rejected the election result and vowed to provide evidence of fraud once the internet was restored. Opposition politicians have also accused the government of harassment. We didn't care about your religion, we didn't care about your tribe, we didn't care about where you are a man or a woman. What we cared about were your qualities as a person. Mr. Museveni, who came to power on the back of an armed uprising in 1986, stood as leader of the National Resistance Movement. He has long been depicted to Ugandans as a liberator and peace bridger. Reports say President Museveni has managed to maintain his grip on power through a mixture of encouraging a personality cult, employing patronage, compromising independent institutions, and sidelining opponents. Musa Baba Ali, NTA News.
Kenya is Rose Mukonyo, a journalist from Kenya who monitors the re-election of President Yuri Museveni. Many thanks for finding time to be with us on the news. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. All right. Now that Yuri Museveni has, uh, has been declared winner of uh, Uganda's presidential election, what is the mood like in Uganda? All right, uh, I, I think we're having a little bit of some technical hitch on that uh, report. We'll go over to our other reports, and as time goes on, I'm sure we can get back uh, with her online. Now, as science continues to blaze new trails of hope in and containing coronavirus pandemic, the world also needs to remember the, sam the simple and proven steps to keep each other safe, such as wearing of masks, physical distancing, and avoiding crowds. Adebola Brooksling Sunday reports that United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres met the plea as COVID-19 pandemic claims 2 million lives. The UN scribe said behind the staggering number of deaths are names and faces of loved ones. Memory of those 2 million souls, the world must act with far greater solidarity. Now is the time. Safe Effective COVID-19 vaccines are being rolled out, and the UN is supporting countries to mobilize the largest global immunization effort in history. We are committed to making sure that vaccines are seen as global public goods, people's vaccines. That requires full funding for the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and its COVAX facility, which is dedicated to making vaccines available and affordable to all. Vaccines are reaching high-income countries quickly, while the world's poorest have none at all. Science is succeeding, but solidarity is failing. Governments have a responsibility to protect their populations, but vaccine nationalism is self-defeating and will delay a global recovery. To gain public trust, we must boost vaccine confidence and knowledge with effective communication grounded in facts. said the deadly impact of the pandemic has been made worse by the absence of a global coordinated effort, adding that the world can only get ahead of the virus one way, which is togetherness. Now, India begins world's biggest COVID-19 vaccination program. And from the U.S., final execution of Trump's administration is carried out. Joyce Ometu has details of these and more reports on Global Update. India has launched what has been described as the world's largest vaccination program, targeting more than 3 million people. Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched the immunization campaigns to bring the COVID-19 pandemic under control. Sanitation worker Manish Kumar is the first person in India to be vaccinated against COVID-19. The country is prioritizing nurses, doctors and other frontline workers. In Norway, 23 elderly people have died within days of receiving their first dose of Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. The Norwegian Medicines Agency said COVID-19 vaccines may be too risky for the very old and terminally ill. The most cautious statement from a European health authority as countries assess the side effects of the first shots to gain approval. In the meantime, several EU countries are now receiving fewer doses of Pfizer coronavirus vaccine than expected as the U.S. firm slowed shipments. Six nations called the situation unacceptable and warned that it decreases the credibility of the vaccination process. Looking at the numbers, there are now more than 94 million reported cases of COVID-19 worldwide, while total confirmed deaths now exceed 2 million. Nigeria accounts for 1,413 of these deaths, with a total of 107,345 positive cases reported by the Center for Disease Control. In other news, all 50 U.S. states and the District of Columbia 
are bracing for possible violent protests ahead of the president-elect Joe Biden's inauguration Wednesday. National Guard troops from across the country are being sent to Washington, D.C. to discourage any repeat of the deadly riot that unfolded on 6th January. Now, staying in the U.S., Dustin Higgs, an inmate on death row in Indiana, has died by lethal injection in the final federal execution of the Trump presidency. Higgs was convicted in the killings of three women in a wildlife refuge in 1996. His execution is the 13th carried out since July. Coming from Africa, the European Union says it is getting consistent reports of ethnic targeted killings and possible war crimes in Ethiopia's northern region of Tigray. The EU says the conflict threatens the stability of the entire region. And that's where we end this segment. I am Joyce Ometu. Many thanks, Joyce, for that package. Now, this is the News on 18 International. Stay for more after the break. Latest entrant, latest technology. Welcome to Intel 4G LTE Advanced and experience super fast internet access today. Visit intel.com.ng or any of our stores in Lagos, Abuja, and Port Harcourt to get started. Intel, live more. Many thanks for being with us on the news. Earlier, we told you that Uganda's Electoral Commission has declared uh, President Yuweri Museveni as the winner of the presidential election conducted last Thursday. And we have joining us uh, via Zoom uh, from Kenya, Rose Mukonyo, who is a journalist and who monitored the re-election. Many thanks for finding time to join us. I do hope that we have better connection now. Yes, I do hope that my connection will be stable this time round. All right, so that, uh, now that uh, Yuwari Museveni has been declared winner of uh, Uganda's presidential election, what is the mood like in Uganda? Can you give us a little bit of um, understanding of what the mood there is? Yes, thank you very much. As I was saying, uh, when before my connection was uh, rudely disconnected, um, it is very difficult for me now to say exactly what is happening in Uganda. As we all know, a, a few hours before the election, the internet was shut down in Uganda. And therefore, much of what has been going on there between the, 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 the polls and after the polls, as the results were getting announced, has not been relayed through the internet up until now because the internet has not been uh, uh, reconnected. So it is very hard to, for me to say that this is what is happening really on the ground. But we all understand that there is a disgruntled, uh, the voters are disgruntled. Uh, we are aware that uh, Bobby Wine has already rejected the results. He has uh, asked the poll, the, the, his supporters to be patient with him. He has uh, asked the uh, he has also made the allegations that there was a lot of fraud and we all know that there was a lot of fraud because we do not understand exactly why the president Yoweri Museveni had to shut down the internet because the internet has been the connection between Bobby Wine and his supporters. He has been uh, airing, uh, he had been showing what he has been doing through the, uh, his Facebook uh, channels, through his YouTube channels, and therefore there has been no communication between him and the outside world. The outside world cannot communicate with uh, Uganda because uh, what I can say is that Uganda is in a total blackout, is in darkness right now because we cannot know what is happening right there. We cannot say this is what uh, is happening on the ground. And uh, because there is no internet, therefore, also the other international media is not relaying what, the, what, what is happening there. And the only uh, TV channels and probably radio channels that are, cover, uh, are doing coverage right now in Uganda are the national TVs and radios in the, in the country. And therefore, they can only relay what uh, Museveni is uh, ordering or is directing them to do because 
basically the the reason why he ordered for the shutdown is because he did not want the world to know exactly what is happening in well in that's that's a, that's in obviously an assumption that's obviously an assumption but then i'd, I'd like you to uh, uh, go a little bit further in the issue of the the shutdown of internet services you know right there in uh, uganda uh, given the fact that the opposition leader and of course the closest rival bobby wine uh, obviously uh, on several occasions have cried out foul while interne international election observers you know questioned the the credibility of uh, the electoral process especially you know with that shutdown of the internet services what does this uh, really portend for credibility of that election Yes, uh, the internet was blocked on the 13th of uh, January, uh, the 13th of January, uh, a few hours before the election, actually. And we know that the UN, the the EU, and the US uh, media and uh, observers were denied accreditation, and therefore they could not cover anything that is ha that was happening there. Of course, we know that there are some independent uh, media houses that went there. We had uh, media represented from Kenya and, and other countries who went to cover that. And, you know, the fact that uh, there's nothing that we can say, there's nothing, we, we cannot even have video clips that uh, Bobby Wine was alleging that he had taken from the, from the polls and uh, the, the fraud that he was talking about. And he actually said that he can only do that after the internet is back. And this means that... All right, uh, many thanks uh, to Rose Bukoyo for that insight. For uh, time period of time butter, there is going to be nothing that... Uh, the many, th many thanks, uh, Rose, for that, your insight on uh, the uh, Ugandan election. We do hope that um, with time, a lot of things will begin to unfold. Yeah. All right, and Minister of Science and Technology Dr. Ogbunayaono has called on the organized private sector to invest in the production and commercialization of indigenous technology so as to improve the nation's gross domestic product. This was during the launch of the disinfection tunnel developed by the National Space Research and Development Agency, NASTA, in Abuja. Justin Bemui reports. The development of the disinfection tunnel is in line with the ministry's drive to develop non-pharmaceutical measures to checkmate the spread of COVID-19. In line with the economic diversification and job creation program of the current administration, the minister urged investors to commercialize the disinfection tunnel and make it available for Nigerian and international markets. Uh, an equipment like this uh, that other people will need, not just in Nigeria, and then we, with this uh, Africa free trade area, uh -huh. you know, other African countries and even foreigners will uh, like to um, patronize such, uh, you know, such uh, an investor you know, who is willing to help commercialize it. So, but the private sector in the country should be able to come in, uh, take advantage of you know this this technology. Uh, one, all the uh, the inputs is locally derived, so they don't have to go outside to import you know import things. Acting Director General of the National Space Research and Development Agency, Dr. Francis Chiza, added that the cost of the tunnel's production was half the cost of buying or importing such technology from abroad. And then the capacity is there for my engineers and scientists to be able to manufacture these for other establishments, private or government, at the same rate. So it's a major breakthrough when it does everything that you require. It takes the temperature, it disinfects you, as it's expected to do. Justin Bemuni, NTA News. And Minister of Interior Rauf Arebeshola has expressed satisfaction with the pace of work at the ongoing construction of Janguza Ultra Modern Custodial Facility in Kano State. The minister, who was on an assessment visit, said federal government will continue to provide a conducive atmosphere for inmates across the country. Mohammed Rabiu Ali reports. Inmates in custodial centers across the country have witnessed changes in detention facilities 
as a result of the federal government's commitment to decongesting them. The ongoing construction of Kano Custodial Center is one among the six in the country with 3,000 capacity. While inspecting the project, Minister of Interior Rauf Arabeshola said the Buhari-led administration is concerned with the condition of image, which brought about significant changes to do away with dehumanizing nature of prisons to serve as correctional centers. I'm quite impressed with the pace of work, with the scope of work, and the quality of work. Uh, as, as, and, and equally, the, the, the design and the provision for the inmates. You have uh, facilities for awaiting trial inmates, facilities for categories of convicts, from, uh, from uh, petty criminals to medium convicts and uh, maximum security convicts. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, promising as a correctional custodial facility. And I must commend support from the president because uh, nobody ever thought of this until the advent of President Mamadou Bari administration. The new dawn in administration of Correctional Center will no doubt launch the country in the League of Nations which observe human rights. The project is expected to be completed before the end of year 2021. Mohamed Raibu Ali, NTA News. President Buhari condoles with Sultan of Sokoto over brother's demise and sympathizes also with Sokoto government, Tam, Governor Tambuwal in a statement signed by the Senior Special Assistant to the President, Media and Publicity, President Muhammad, Muhammad Buhari expressed his condolence over the death of Abdukhadri Jale Abubakar, Deacon Sokoto, the Commissioner of Home Affairs in Sokoto State and younger brother to the Sultan of Sokoto Saad Abubakar III. President Buhari also condoled with the family of the disease as well as the Governor of Sokoto State, Aminu Tambuwal, for losing someone there to them all. In the meantime, President Muhammad Buhari expresses condolences over the passage of Hajiya Fatima Fanta Garba Mohammed immediate younger sister of late head of state general sani abacha and mother of senator bashir Mohammed lado federal commissioner national commission for refugees migrants and internally displaced persons idps in in a release signed by the senior special assistants to the president media and publicity president sympathizes with the Abacha family, Senator Lado, and his siblings, as well as the people of Kano State, noting that Haji Afanta, who lived to the age of 75, devoted her time on earth to caring for the less privileged and godly upbringing of her children. President Buhari prays that Allah will console all those who mourn and grant Haji Afanta Aljanato Fidels. All right, and that's it on the news on NTA International. Many thanks for being with us, but do remember to connect with the NTA and stand against rape and rapists. I'm Chimobi Walter Najin.